Hello, my name's Dr Dorothy Price. I'm an art historian who specialises in German modernism, German art of the 20th century, and I lecture at the University of Bristol. I've been involved with Leicester Museum and Art Gallery's uh, refurbishment project of their German Expressionist collection through um, the commissioning of some specialist reports that I have co-authored with uh, my colleagues, Drs Jill Lloyd and Christian Weikop. Um, and we worked on the project of the reports together, trying to assess the significance and importance of, the Leicester, of Leicester's German Expressionist collection in relation to uh, Expressionism worldwide. I am particularly interested in German Expressionism, um, having done my first degree in the history of art at Leicester Museum and Art Gallery, um, and taking a specialist unit then on German Expressionism. And that has really structured my uh, trajectory as an art historian um, ever since, um, and particularly the role of the New York collections in kind of thinking about the development of my research on German Expressionism. Um, my first book and my PhD thesis um, were called Representing Berlin, um, Sexuality and the City in German Modernism. And I looked at works by German artists of the period represented by the Leicester Collection um, and looked at their responses to the city. Um, and the term expressionism is a particularly interesting one in that its history is very um, fraught with definitional, definitional difficulties. Um, it's a very elastic term, and it was actually first introduced into Germany um, by critics who were actually looking at French art. So it has a quite an early relationship with a description of French artists who were associated with the Fauves, who were like, exhibiting in Germany, in Berlin, in the early 1900s. Um, and their work was described um, as, as expressionistic. Um, and a lot of the critics of the period um, sort of said that German artists of the same period should take influence from the French artists like the Fauves um, and start to think expressionistically about their work as well. I think expressionism as an interesting term um, is, is something that has some very particular resonances with German art. So many artists, any artist can be described as expressive, um, but only a certain handful are actually described as expressionist. And I think the difference really is between the idea of simply the ability to express oneself in paint and very gestural brush marks, which is a characteristic of German Expressionism. But I think the difference with German Expressionism is that the artists working in the period who are associated with the term really operated on a sort of dialectic between trying to convey um, inner feelings, inner emotions in an expressive manner. Um, and, and thinking about the external world in relationship to the internal. The history of the collection of German Expressionist art at Leicester's New York Museum and Art Gallery is a particularly interesting one. It's a particularly interesting tale of exile and émigré um, as a result of uh, the Second World War and the rise of Nazism in Germany. Um, and the persecution of uh, Jewish uh, artists, art historians and collectors. Um, and it was really due to the incredible foresight of the director of Leicester Museum and Art Gallery, Trevor Thomas, who was director of the Museum and Art Gallery in Leicester between 1940 and 1946, um, who... Uh, had encountered German art in America a few years earlier and was particularly interested in it. And um, when a number of German Jewish refugees came over uh, fleeing Nazi Germany and landed in the Midlands, uh, they were supported by uh, the Free German League of Culture uh, and set up a sort of home from home in the Midlands, in Leicester, in Loughborough, in Birmingham. Um, and um, through the, the Free Artist German League of Culture uh, and exhibitions um, that they put on, Trevor Thomas became acquainted with um, Tekla Hess um, and through her son Hans Hess, who uh, Trevor Thomas appointed to act as um, an assistant curator at Leicester Museum and Art Gallery. And it was from there in 1944 that Thomas had the foresight to put on a fabulous exhibition called Modern European Painting. And it was a cannily chosen title 
um, because it was primarily a collection of German painting that he was displaying in 1944 during the Second World War when Anglo-German relations were not at their best um, in the history of uh, modern Europe. Um, but, but Thomas nevertheless um, had made the brave move to show, to show this work and it was from there that he also managed to acquire um, four significant pieces from that collection, including um, Franz Marc's Red Woman of 1912, which is perhaps the jewel in Leicester's crown. One of the really interesting aspects of Leicester Museum and Art Gallery's collection of German Expressionist art is the focus on women as both subject matter and in terms of the artists represented in the collection. Um, and Leicester Museum and Art Gallery's collection of German art is, I think, almost unique in this aspect of its focus on women as artists. There were, there were numerous really successful women artists working in Germany throughout the 1900s um, until um, the 1930s um, when a caesura occurred in which um, women artists were no longer um, uh, acceptable to work um, because they weren't conforming to national socialist ideals of women in the home. But until that period, um, the arts in Germany flourished through its female practitioners um, and Leicester Museum and Art Gallery are particularly lucky in having excellent representative collections um, by the printmaker Kirta Kolwitz, um, as well as um, a beautiful painting um, of Anna Rosalind or Anna Angard by Gabriella Munter, um, and a self-portrait by the German artist Lotte Laserstein, and I'd like to talk a little bit about all of those works. But I wanted to start by thinking about Franz Marc's Red Woman of 1912 um, in terms of women as subjects in German art. Um, and I think Franz Marc's uh, painting is particularly interesting in that he wasn't most well known for his figure paintings, which makes this a very unusual work and a very rare work, which is why I think it's partly um, part of, kind of Leicester's most prized work. Um, Franz Marc tragically um, died in Verdun in 1916, so he didn't leave a great number of paintings behind. And so again, this is what makes Red Woman a particularly unique work. It's the only work by Franz Marc in a British collection, the only painting by Franz Marc in a British collection. Um, and it's rather lovely in that it's um, showing the figure of the Red Woman, um, with her back to us, the viewer, with her head slightly turned. It's the kind of romanticised position of a woman seen from the back. Um, and um, she's blending in with her surroundings. So there's a real sort of sense of a relationship between um, women and nature in this work, um, which is quite a strong theme of German Expressionism um, in the work of Kirchner as well um, and in the work of many other um, avant-garde uh, modernist male artists um, and the idea of women being associated with the decorative has been problematized um, by feminist art historians um, and this is why I think it's it's quite interesting that um, Marx Red Woman is kind of so nicely counterpointed in Leicester's collection by self-identification of women artists um, with themselves in representation, um, particularly in uh, Lotte Laserstein's um, self-portrait of 1930. Um, so I think there's a really nice thematic within Leicester's collection of um, thinking about women and how women are represented. So Mark's um, painting of a red woman is very much associated with his time as a Blauer writer or Blue Rider artist, a group of artists based in Munich just before the First World War. Um, and they were very interested in thinking about um, avant-garde strategies for representation. And many members of the Blauer Reiter, including Vasily Kandinsky and August Macker, Mark's immediate compatriots, and Gabriella Munter, um, were all interested in the use of colour. Um, and I think you can see that very clearly in Franz Marc's Red Woman. Mark developed his own colour symbolism. Um, whereby blue was uh, thought to be representative of uh, what he called a male or a masculine principle. Yellow was derived, uh, was thought to be um, a feminine principle. Um, and red was um, thought to represent matter or the earth. And so again, one can see how red woman 
um, there's a sort of relationship between form and content in what Mark is painting here, that he is uh, allying his red woman very much to the natural world. She is um, a sort of um, a representative example of an interest in primitivism during this period as well. And we know that Mark was very interested in Cameroonian objects. He saw Cameroonian tribal objects in the ethnographic museums in Paris, um, where he visited. Um, and I think one can see that kind of influence coming through in Red Woman, in her tattoo, in her blue feather earring, um, and in her long black hair. Um, a very different kind of representation of a woman by a fellow Blau writer, artist, um, is Gabriella Munter's 1917 portrait of Anna Angard, or Anna Rosalund, um, as she was known uh, at the time. Um, and Anna Rosalund, the sitter, uh, was the sister, the youngest sister of uh, Nell Valden. And Nell Valden was married to Herwart Valden, who was a key figure in Berlin during uh, the Expressionist era, in that he owned um, the Sturm Gallery, the Storm Gallery, and he was a, a very strong supporter of Expressionist artists, and he helped to prom collect, promote, and sell their work. Uh, and he was a particularly strong supporter of Kandinsky, who was Gabriella Munter's um, partner um, in the pre-war era. Um, and when the war broke out, Gabriela Munta was German, Kandinsky was Russian, Kandinsky had to go back to Russia during the First World War, uh, and the an animosity between Russia and Germany meant that it was difficult for Munter and Kandinsky to co uh, continue their relationship and continue to collaborate. Uh, and so um, they chose Sweden as a neutral country through which they could uh, continue to communicate. And it was through Nell Valden's sister, Anna Rosalund, who was Swedish and who lived in Sweden, um, and the kind of Rosalund family and, and the Valden connection, that Munter was able to establish a new network of artists in Sweden. And she moved to Sweden for a period of time. Kandinsky and Munter um, both held um, an exhibition there um, together. And that was where they were to reunite during the period of the First World War because it was neutral ground. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. And Kandinsky abandoned Munter uh, and married somebody else. But Munter, for a period, lived in Sweden and had a very flourishing exile career as a German woman artist living in Sweden. And this is where the portrait of Anna Rosalind comes from. Um, and what's really nice about the portrait of Anna Rosalind is that it's very typical Anoya Frau. She has short cropped hair, she's very assertive. Anoya Frau uh, in, uh, is the German for new woman. Um, and sort of representative examples of new women are that they have this kind of short bobbed hair, they have um, uh, a sort of certain assertiveness to them, uh, which Anna Rosalind certainly does. She's both con contemplative and assertive, I think, and she smokes a pipe great symbol of her bohemianism um, and there are these large fabulous areas of flat colour and there's these accents of red and blue throughout the painting um, and it's a very rhythmic kind of painting and very sort of typical of, of Munter's Blauerreiter style and it makes a nice contrast I think with Lotte Lazerstein's 1930 painting um, a self-portrait with Cat um, <clears throat> which is also in the Leicester collections um, and it's a work of some uh, 13 years later, but you can see, I think, some similarities in the representation of the um, self-confident new woman uh, that one can see in both Lazerstein's painting of self-portrait with Cat and uh, Munter's portrait of Anna Rosalind. Um, uh, and I think the comparison and having both of these fabulous oil paintings in Leicester's collection makes a really nice way of thinking about that theme. I think what's very interesting about German Expressionism as well is how it has continued to live on in different forms within contemporary culture. Um, so whilst um, the names of German Expressionist artists or particular groups might not trip off the tongue for modern British audiences today, names such as Tracy Emin are perhaps more familiar to modern British audiences. Um, and um, Tracy Emin has been very explicit about her um, influences um, from German Expressionism, and in particular 
from the Norwegian artist Edvard Munch um, and the Austrian expressionist artist Egon Schiele. And you can see a direct lineage in her work. In fact, she even made a homage to both of them in a film um, which kind of reanimated um, the, the set at the pier where Edvard Munch's The Scream um, was thought to be painted. Um, and so in that sense, within the visual arts, expressionism definitely lives on and has a strong legacy and other contemporary artists also draw on its forms. And I think what's so appealing about some of the forms of expressionism, even when one might not know much about it as an art form, uh, is the use of colour. The vibrant use of colour is the distinct hallmark of expressionist painting and the relationship between colour and form as well. And this idea that expressionism can be about the exploration of inner states of mind or states of being, about the idea of anxiety uh, and jubilation as well. Um, one often associates expressionism with kind of more negative emotional aspects, but there was also celebratory aspects. You know, German expressionists were interested in the ecstatic as well as um, the anxious. And so again, the relationship between kind of ecstasy and also extreme kind of nervous tension is again a characteristic of, of, um, of German Expressionist art, I think. Um, and that relationship between external appearance and, and inner states uh, is what continues to appeal, I think, to many audiences um, interested in kinds of Expressionism. And it's perhaps translated most popularly within film, within Expressionist film. Um, and films like The Cabinet of Dr Caligari, um, uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, um, M, Lulu, all of the kind of great films of the 1920s in Germany were essentially expressionist films and they continue to have a legacy and impact on the American film industry um, and in fact also some of the British film industry too. Um, a lot of uh, German filmmakers, German Jewish filmmakers also had to leave Nazi Germany in the 1930s and went to Hollywood, continuing the relationship between American and German um, filmmakers. Um, and more recently, people like Tim Burton um, in Edward Scissorhands, for example, um, and in fact in many of Tim Burton's kind of gothic inspired films, there is a sort of legacy of the kind of camera angles, the stark contrasting sets, the theatricality of um, the films. Um, again, it's a direct legacy, I think, from, from German Expressionism. Although Expressionism is not widely known in this country at all, not in the same way that perhaps Impressionism might be, I think a key thing is to come to the collections at Leicester with an open mind and to enjoy the works for what they are. They're celebrations of colour and of people's lives. They were born of youthful optimism. So many of the artists um, whom one can encounter through the paintings in Leicester's collection were very young when they painted. They were just out of art school. So they were young people and they were celebrating and experimenting with the possibilities that life had to offer them.